Greetings AP European History Scholars. This is our review on Unit 2, the Reformation and Religious Wars. Looking at the review sheet from top to bottom, Desiderius Erasmus and In Praise of Folly and his influence on the Reformation. It has been said that Erasmus laid the egg which Luther hatched. Both were Catholic, but Erasmus stayed loyal to the church, and Luther, of course, broke with it. But Erasmus wrote perhaps one of the, the, the most widely read book of the Renaissance period in praise of folly, in which he criticized the corruption and the greed and the use of power in the Catholic Church. And remember that Erasmus is part of the North, Northern uh, Renaissance which called for reform, and Erasmus helped to prepare, or actually he did prepare, a Greek New Testament, which is part of this Renaissance going back to the ancient original sources. Causes of the Reformation or problems in the Catholic Church, be familiar with some of these terms here. Simony is the buying and selling of church offices, multiple offices, or pluralism refers to a person who would purchase a bishopric or control of a diocese and then would buy another one and another one to basically skim the tithe money for their own profit. And by definition, if you are a bishop in more than one diocese, you're going to be absent from at least one or more of them. So you have absenteeism and you also have the problems in the papacy of um, exercising political power, engaging in war and persecution, inquisition. The church was seen as a force for violence and bigotry and just political corruption. You have the inquisition, you have sexual immorality, and you have, unfortunately, and the lower ranks, quite a bit of, of ignorance and um, even illiteracy where many priests had just simply memorized the, the liturgy. So there's a lot of criticism of the church in this time period. Keep in mind here the Renaissance and Reformation are really concurrent. Most books separate out, the, separate out the Reformation, but Erasmus is, you know, writing this criticism of the church, and we read about him in the Renaissance chapter, but Luther is also a critic of the church, and this is really happening by and large in the same overall time period. The impact of the printing press, this is one of these Renaissance era inventions, which spreads ideas, ideas of dissent by both loyal critics like Erasmus and those who are willing to make a break with the Catholic Church, such as Martin Luther. Luther is this Augustinian monk who was seeking the assurance of his salvation, and he wrote the 95 Theses in criticism, inviting debate over indulgences. Indulgences are a sort of a penance, which is, a penance is supposed to be a church discipline, but the indulgences, which perhaps originally the sale of them, the money is supposed to go to the poor, it's supposed to encourage charity, the penances got hijacked by the, um, you know, the hierarchy to be used for um, you know, basically greedy purposes and the Pope is selling indulgences in German territories to help raise money to build St. Peter's. And the famous salesman here is Johann or uh, John Tetzel, and there's that famous ditty, when into a, the coffer a penny rings, out of purgatory a soul springs. And Luther's problem before God, before discovering Romans 1, 17, Luther feared for his salvation in the face of an almighty a holy God who was angry at his sins, Luther fasted, he prayed, he confessed, he um, took vows as a, a monk of celibacy and poverty and obedience, and but he was never certain that God would accept him, that he was not damned, until he discovered Romans 1, 17, which says the righteous shall live by faith, and that means those who God deems righteous, those who are pure, those who are forgiven, um, are saved by their faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, that a merciful and loving God through Christ saves man in spite of everything he has done, and, um, and there's nothing that man can do to earn this salvation. So this is this turning point in the Reformation here. Sola fide, sola scriptura, and sola gratia. These are the three solas. You should know these Latin terms. Sola fide means we are saved by faith, not by works, not by what we do, not by charity, fasting, prayer, confession, but by the completed work of Jesus Christ. Sola Scriptura is this, uh, this idea you see put forward at the Council of Arms, where, where, 
where Luther says, here I stand, I can do no other, that the he stands on Scripture, the authority of Scripture, not popes, not creeds, not councils, but Scripture is the authority to which all Christians must bow. And sola gratia is the idea that it's God's grace, it's God's mercy that saves us. The peasants war in Germany, 1524 through 25. The, the peasants take Luther's rebellion as basically an okay for them to rebel against the oppression of the German lords. And Luther famously, uh, notoriously, takes the side of the of the lords against the peasants. And he writes that famous diatribe in which he urges the lords to to slay and to kill these thieving hordes of peasants. About 100,000 of them do die. John Calvin and Geneva. John Calvin sets up a theocratic government in Geneva, Switzerland. And you should know the, the acronym or the acrostic, TULIP. TULIP refers to T, the idea that man is totally depraved. There is no good in man whatsoever. U is unconditional election. God does the saving. We can't even have faith because that means we can do something. So God is electing us, and that comes from uh, Ephesians chapter 1. It is God who chooses in his sovereignty, in his mercy. L is limited atonement. God has chosen some, not all. Some are actually damned, and that's called reprobation. So the atonement of Jesus, his death and resurrection, is only going to be applied to some, not all. I is irresistible grace. You cannot say no to God. God saves those he chooses. And P is perseverance of the saints. Sometimes it's called preservation of the saints. And that is you can't lose your salvation. If God is doing the saving, God has his hand on you. And you can't do anything. You can't do anything to win your salvation. You can't do anything to lose it either. This idea of um, predestination, sometimes you'll hear the phrase double predestination. Election is God chooses some for salvation. Reprobation, reprobation is that God has chosen some for damnation. Why? How this is, we, we can only um, uh, guess, and we can't know, but there's this idea that God is sovereign, that God does what God will. The Institutes of the Christian Religion are Calvin's detailed explanation of Reformation doctrine as in uh, theology. Broke art is art which is going to um, exalt monarchs, but it's also going to exalt the church. And it's a, it's, a, it's a style of art in which the Catholic Church emphatically says that art is pleasing to God. Art comes from God and that the truths of the Christian religion can be portrayed in statuary and in stained glass and in painting and icons. And Bernini uh, is a... Um, He's a sculptor. Uh, his name is Gian Lorenzo Bernini. And the one piece that you will be, should know on your test here is the ecstasy of St. Ter uh, Teresa. And she is this mystic who has this rapturous encounter with the love of Christ. And there's that famous statue where she's sort of um, clutching her bosom. She's been uh, speared with the, uh, the love of Christ, which is coming in the fo um, from a, an angel. And it's a very... Um, it's a very ornate piece of art, but it's about the love of God, and it's, um, it's sort of, it, it, it represents the Catholic view that art can express religious values. Differing Protestant views on art, you have Luther, who says that unless Scripture says you can't do it, you can have, have art. And in Lutheran churches, you're more likely, at least at the time, to still see stained glass and to see statues and to see various vestments and and incense and things like that. And Luther was a hymn writer, and you have that famous hymn, Mighty Fortress is Our God, and hymns are, are okay in Lutheran circles. When you get to Ulrich Zwingli and some of the Anabaptists, their view is you can't do it unless the Bible says to do it. So if the Bible didn't say to do these things, you're not going to have an organ, you're not going to have a piano, you're not going to have stained glass and statues. In fact, you have what's called iconoclasm, and that is the destruction of statues and icons and stained glass as being idolatry, as being idols which are forbidden in the Old Testament. And uh, you certainly won't, in many of these churches, uh, some of them even today, you do not have hymns, you just have um, music set to the Psalms. Difference 
and similarity between Luther's Reformation and Henry's English Reformation, well, big similarity is a break with Rome, defiance against the authority of the Catholic Church. Luther's Reformation is based upon his search for salvation. It's a theolo theological reformation at its base. Henry's English Reformation is, as you remember, it's because he wants a divorce from his wife and he wants to marry a new wife and get a, a son so he can carry on his name. And he also seizes, Henry that is, Henry VIII, seizes the churches and the wealth of the monasteries. So there's greed involved in this. Anglicanism, similarity uh, to Catholicism is that the Anglican Church at the time keeps confession, it has a very high view of communion. In fact, even today, many Anglicans believe this is the body and blood of Christ, not a symbol in any way. You have the use of things like vestments and the smells and bells and the incense, um, and a, a lot like the Lutherans, use of art and stained glass and statuary. But a big thing here in Anglicanism is a continued use of bishops, that the, um, the king here, Henry VIII, um, kept the whole ecclesiastical system where you have bishops, which is very different later on from the Puritans who are going to have a con congregational form of government where the people themselves pick the, the ministers to rule over them. Edward VI is this son of Henry VIII who rules for a few years. And you get the Book of P Common Prayer, which is the common prayer book, the liturgy that's used in all Anglican churches even today. Mary is the next in the line. She's going to try to yank the, the Anglican Church back into the Catholic Church. She's famous for killing many, uh, many Protestants at the stake. And Elizabeth comes after Mary dies, and Elizabeth is going to reimpose Anglicanism. But she is known for what's called the Via Media, or the Elizabethan Settlement. And the idea here is to keep peace, to keep order, to keep prosperity, and to avoid the religious wars of Europe, which are tearing France and tearing Germany apart and many of the other countries in the Thirty Years' War. And she is not allowing religious toleration, but she's not hunting people down. She does things such as the theology is a little murky, deliberately so. Um, it, she's keeping more of the Lutheran Catholic view of communion. She, uh, the, the clergy, is still wearing vestments, and you have these bells and smells, kind of a metaphor referring to incense and referring to, um, you know, high choirs and and um, just the, the the statues and the stained glass and things like that. You also have her taking the title. She's the governor of the church. She's not the supreme head, so she's working to alleviate resentments and fears on both sides, those who lean more Catholic and those who lean a little bit more towards the continental uh, Calvinism of um, the later to, to come Puritans in, in England. Mary again, Mary, um, one of the questions here on the review sheet is religious policies of these women. Mary tries to impose, does uh, reimpose Catholicism until she dies, in which case Elizabeth I follows this middle way. Catherine de' Medici will launch the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, in which she kills thousands of, of Huguenot Calvinist Protestants in, in France here. She is trying to protect her son's claim to the, thr the valet throne of France. And the Huguenots, there are some dynasties here among the Huguenots who are challenging the, um, the Valois dynasty. And Isabella of Spain, also called Isabella in Spanish, she marries uh, Ferdinand and Isabella, along with her husband, they defeat the Moors, they, um, they end the hold of Islam on Spain, and they toss out um, several hundred thousand Jews. And the idea here is there is going to be a monolithic Catholic orthodoxy. France, religious wars um, tear France apart, 10-15% of the population will die. This is Catholics versus Huguenots who are uh, Protestants, who are Calvinists, and this ends when Henry IV of Navarre ascends the throne. He's going to marry one of the Valois daughters, and he's going to issue the Edict of Nantes. And even though he is a Calvinist, he will convert to Catholicism. The famous quote is, Paris is worth the Mass, and he allows the Huguenots to worship freely. 
The uh, reason why many Huguenots before him converted again is its defiance against the Valois dynasty. It's a statement of independence as well as perhaps a statement of, a of actual belief. You have after Luther in Germany the Schmalkaldic League, kind of a mouthful there. The Schmalkaldic League are these Protestant Lutheran princes who fight um, Catholic princes in a, in a war that tears Germany apart for a number of years, and this is this ends with the Treaty of Augsburg, in which you have the phrase "Huis Regio, Eus religi religi Religio." Um, I've gone on uh, YouTube to see how to pronounce this, and some of the guys call it "Huis Regio, Eus Religio," and there's this Italian guy who calls it "Huis Regio, Eus Religio." So um, I will plead ignorance on how this is actually pronounced here, but the "Huis Regio, Eus Religio" refers to the prince choosing the religion of his realm. Not the people, it's not tolerance here, but it's allowing the princes, which basically is an acknowledgement of their sort of de facto sovereignty. Reasons why rulers might convert to Protestantism? Well, there's belief, maybe they really you know, believe that, that Luther's theology is correct, this idea of sola fide, sola scriptura, but there's also nationalism, defiance against the Italians who are milking the German states dry here for you know, money heading down to Italy. There's also defiance against the Holy Roman Emperor. It's a statement of your your independence from him. And then, of course, there's the wealth to be taken once churches and mon monasteries and their lands are taken over. The Thirty Years' War will tear Germany apart. About half of all German men will die, about a third of all Germans. And this is a war that includes Swedes and Danes and Austrians and French and Dutch and um, if I, and the, the Czechs are the same as the Bohemians, and this will end with the Treaty of Westphalia, which will be a reinstatement of the Qus Regio Eus Religio, and that is um, going to include, though, the Calvinist option. So there's a plan C here. Um, the rulers can pick Catholicism, they can pick Lutheranism or Calvinism, and those are your choices. The Anabaptists are le left in the lurch. They're persecuted by everyone. The impact of the Reformation on the Holy Roman Empire will weaken the power of the Holy Roman Emperor as the German states get to pick their religion. The political consequences of the Reformation, there's lots of political consequences. This was a question once um, on the AP at one time, German rulers picking their religion. You've got this idea of the magisterial reformation. Calvin and Luther said the princes are in charge of religion in their territories once the Catholic Church's grip is loosened. The Holy Roman Emperor at the end of the Thirty Years' War loses much of his power over the German states. Calvin has a theocracy in Geneva. The Netherlands, who are Calvinists um, after during the Reformation, will declare their independence from Spain in the Thirty Years' War. You've got Henry VIII who will break um, break with Rome, and he will declare himself the head of the Anglican Church. You've got the Thirty Years' War, which will end this idea, this idea of Christendom, that there will be a united Christian Church, which you had during the Middle Ages. You've got Philip's attempted invasion of England in 1588. So there's a lot of different political consequences of the Reformation. The Counter-Reformation, this is the attempt to, to defeat the, Reform, the Reformers, to defeat the forces of Reformation in Northern Europe, to bring Europe back into the Catholic orbit, and certainly to stop the spread of the Reformation in Southern Europe. It is not successful in Northern Europe. Some of the methods are the Inquisition, the Index, the Council of Trent, which does bring about moral reform and you know, sets up synods and such in the Catholic Church, but it does reemphasize doctrine. It is emphatic. It does not yield on any point of doctrine to the Reformers. As for the Anabaptists, their difference in, towards church and state is they're kind of the odd man out. They believe that there should be separation of church and state. There should not be duress. duress. There should not be coercion in religious belief. They tended to be pacifists. They tended to follow the Sermon on the Mount, not to take oaths. And they are pretty much despised by Calvinists, Lutherans, and Catholics. And remember, the magisterial reformers are those who believe that the magistrate that the um, political authorities should be in charge of the church, that the church should be in charge, or the state should be in charge of enforcing morality. Once the Catholics no longer have this power, it's going to be the job of good Christian emperors in their respective states. So there's your drive-by review here for the Unit 2 test. 
Um, study well. Everything on here represents a question that is on the test. So signing off from the library.